Thank you all so much for coming. James Bond is probably the most famous civil servant of all time. <laughs> His approach towards officialdom was rooted in a strong sense of autonomy, a high mission orientation, a vibrant approach to searching out detailed information on a case-by-case -case basis, and a culture of strong professional relationships. And this approach is increasingly being seen as the optimal way to organize public administration. How do we know? Well, 50 years on from Goldfinger, we're finally gathering the data to test theories of public administration at the most micro level. By micro level, I mean here the individual organization, the individual official, the individual task. And this data revolution is happening on multiple fronts, global, national, sectoral, and organizational. And over the next half an hour or so, I'd like to go through some of this data with you and describe what it teaches us about fixing bureaucracies. You see, for most of the modern era of economic statistics, data on the public sector has taken the form of a single summary statistic, and perhaps the most famous of those is ART's worldwide governance indicators, which has been a boon to our understanding of the public sector across nations. But as you'll see, there's so much variation in the public sector of a single country that uh, there's been interest, a complementary interest, in generating more granular data on individuals through surveys, and the bank through People like Nick Manning and co-authors and Danny Kaufman and colleagues really have been at the forefront of this effort as well. And this idea of potentially being able to set up a, a global architecture for surveying public officials at scale, just like the bank has done for citizens, for firms and beyond, it was what made me excited about coming here. At the same time, a complementary effort has created some fantastic studies at the sector or organization level in academia, researchers at the bank and elsewhere, that are useful to answering questions of how we fix bureaucracies. So, serving as a repository for data on public administration that our country and operational colleagues need to really make progress on reform, the bank, I think, is at the heart of making data on all of these fronts. But at the same time, I'd like to bring in some of the results of studies that other researchers from outside the bank have shown us what bureaucracies literally look like. You know, I came to the bank with a passion to build the architecture of what we now call the Bureaucracy Lab, the logo up there. I co-founded the Bureaucracy Lab with a gentleman called Vivak Shravastava and now have fantastic co-leads, Zahid Hasnain and Lida Bettatini. And as a team, we've built global statistics based on the bank's harmonized household surveys. So we've micro-founded global statistics on the public sector. We've started a major surveying and productivity diagnostic initiative, trying to get a, eventually an enterprise survey or an LSMS-like survey, but for the public administration. And we've provided countries with advice based on their own administrative data and brought experimentation to the bank in a, in a major way through the DIME initiative. So the Bureaucracy Lab is a wider part of a trend, basically bringing micro-level analysis to public administration, such that we really do have a better understanding of bureaucracy than we did 10 years ago. So, what does this all mean for the big question of how you fix bureaucracies? <laughs> what I'm gonna mean by bureaucracy is this middle tier of managers, not the politicians and not frontline service providers. Their environment, these public managers, differs markedly from politicians or frontline providers, and they're, they're perhaps the most understudied public agents on the planet. So what, what we're going to argue is that data is shining a light on who they are, what they do, and what they care about, so that we can build appropriate incentives to get them to perform. So why all this effort? So in an in a age of social media, I thought the best way was to tweet at you some convincing arguments, some bureaucracy facts. So firstly, the public sector directly manages 20% of low-income economies. So if you want to fix productivity, if you want to fix growth, you really have to fix bureaucracy. 
41.5% of formal employment is in the public sector. So if you want to fix jobs and employment, you have to fix bureaucracy. And by the way, as an aside, we know that now because we created these worldwide bureaucracy indicators. Now moving to individual studies, work that I did with Imran Rasul in Nigeria showed that a standard deviation improvement in management practices within the bureaucracy can be associated with a 34% increase in project implementation rates. So if you want to fix your infrastructure, you've got to fix the bureaucracy. Then we went on to work in Ghana with Martin Williams. We found that a standard deviation improvement in management can be associated with an 8% increase in GDP of direct productivity gains. So again, if you want to fix your growth, you've got to fix the bureaucracy. Moving to work by Michael Best and co-authors, what they find is shifting the 25th percentile of least effective Russian procurement bureaucrats. So that's taking all the 25% worst procurement officers and just shifting them to the 75th percentile, basically taking the left end of the tail and just making it as good as the 75th percentile will save the government 10.7% of procurement expenditures. So if you want to fix your fiscal sustainability, you've got to fix the bureaucracy. And then finally, this, this broad notion that bureaucrats transform political preferences into policies. And therefore, if you're thinking about who receives public goods, rights and equity issues, you have to fix the bureaucracy. So I think I've just about covered the entire bank's portfolio of work. But I'm sure I could come up with an argument why what you're doing, you've got to fix the bureaucracy. And what I want to do is I want to structure this conversation um, around a kind of production function for bureaucracies. So there's this very nice paper by Laporte et al. in 1999, which basically says there are three themes of public administration um, that for a long time, this is the way that the literature has organized itself around studying bureaucracy. So, those three themes that they brought out were the following. One, economic, that we can make small tweaks to the canonical utility function of economic agents to try and understand why public sector agents work in the way they do. But around that, because it's the public sector, is wrapped political constraints. And these political constraints interact with those economic ones. And then finally, cultural constraints, the culture of the bureaucracy itself that seems to have these long-term impacts on how bureaucrats behave. So what I want to do is I just want to go through the evidence base from these micro data sets on each of those three features. I'm going to say most about the economics, a little about the politics, and we know least about the cultural, but that really is the frontier. So that'll take us in some ways up to where we are now in the research group. So let me begin with the economics. Okay. So we all know that the utility function of a standard agent is based on the prize or price they're paid for undertaking tasks T, and then they subtract from that the effort cost of undertaking that task. Well, a kind of classical first step away for bureaucrats from that canonical model is that many bureaucratic tasks are multitasking. So in particular, public goods have multiple tasks for their creation. You know, almost by definition, if a good has spillovers onto other agents, this will impose additional tasks on the bureaucrat who's generating that good. A classic example of this is in public administration, the state's typically held responsible for residual shocks. If there's a shock, for example, a natural shock, the public sector is typically seen as the entity that has to resolve or put action and intervene in that env environment. However, we know very little about whether that's true. You know, the basic descriptives of bureaucracy just haven't existed to date. So there's this notion that bureaucrats multitask, but there's very little empirical evidence to say that that's true. And so this notion that they multitask, they don't specialize, they work on very complex tasks, the lack of data, it makes economic models and core models of economics harder to test. But similarly, in an operational sense, bank staff themselves working on public administration operations have few basic descriptives as to what public agents are doing all day. Now, the bank has frequently been at the forefront of providing this kind of descriptive evidence for many other sectors. And so the lab has tried to put some effort into doing exactly that. 
So what we did when we went to Ghana, this is data from Ghana, we audited for every single civil service organization, organization by organization, unit by unit, what people are doing, what bureaucrats do on a daily basis. And this pie chart represents the census of all civil service tasks undertaken by the Ghanaian civil service within a year, and then represents them in broad categories. So three salient features jump out to me. The first is that the work really is very different. The profile of work is different to politicians or frontline service delivery agents. They're not undertaking what James Q. Wilson in his book Bureaucracy called production tasks, tasks that are pre uh, precisely specified in advance, that you can progress towards these goals and they can be reliably measured. These are more like craft tasks. So, you know, second, we can say that these areas of work can be characterized by their potential for multitasking, complexity, ambiguity, exactly as the theoretical notions of the bureaucracy would, would say. You know, for example, in the case of policy development here, 23% of what Ghanaian civil servants are doing, it's hard to do it right partly because it spans multiple task areas, but it's also hard to know whether it's been done right. You know, what does a good policy look like is very hard for a public sector manager to judge. And then thirdly, purely this descriptive notion that the red is basically managing the bureaucracy itself. So 40% of what the bureaucracy does is just keeping the beast alive. And models of, you know, the bureaucracy I don't see have typically sort of understood that a lot of what bureaucrats do is simply keep bureaucracy going. Understanding these things better just by providing descriptives helps us better understand the kind of environment that these operatives are working in. But let's think a little bit about specialization. So we can take those seven categories that I've just shown you. And we can assess the extent to which organizations are specializing. So each of these categories now have all the tasks in that area stacked. And each of the colors, the bands, is a single organization undertaking those tasks. So what we see, highlighted by the different colors in each of the uh, columns, is that every single organization is being, you know, performing a bit of everything. There's no specialization. And at the organization level, we can say that bureaucracies very much are multitasking. So even if we take a specific subset of these tasks, so infrastructure, and now what we do is we break infrastructure into multiple pieces. And so we ask, you know, with something as specialized as the development of physical infrastructure, and now turning to Nigeria, this is data from, from Nigeria, do organizations frequently implement a wide range of types of infrastructure? They do, in parallel with their colleagues. So whilst there's a big descriptive exercise to continue here, the sort of early evidence is that multitasking is very much a public administration phenomenon. So the question is, why does that matter? It matters when incentives are put in place to reward effort on a specific set of targets. So since some components of the production function of a project may be harder to observe than others, the official may skew their efforts towards some aspects of the project than others. So here what we have is, is a reminder that the prize, the price you're paid for a task, isn't an exact measurement of what was achieved on that task. It's some noisy measure. So that measure may be incomplete for various reasons, and then you add the fact that the world is noisy. And so as the task becomes more ambiguous to observe, it becomes harder for the manager to observe that effort. So what we want to do is see what does the microempirical evidence say about whether this happens in practice? Now, as we're going to talk about reputation later, I just want to seed something in your mind. An official's colleagues might be able to observe the efforts and achievements in a way that can't be categorized in a performance system. So going back to the Nigeria data, what Imran and I did was we had engineers take every single project that we were studying, these engineers who've got nothing to do with the projects, independent, and go through all the project documents and categorize how ambiguous, how uncertain a project might be in implementation. And so what we have on the x-axis is this index of ambiguity, how ambiguous the project would be for a TTL to implement how many shocks he might receive, how, did, how uncertain the environment might be that he's implementing it. And then here on the x-axis is you have the coefficient of the impact of incentives related to performance incentives and, and kind of a performance framework. And so 
What we can do is by each of those groups of projects that I've shown you, we can say, what's the impact, the marginal impact of performance incentives? What we see at very low levels of ambiguity towards me on this ambiguity index, just like we see in many frontline studies where there's a basic task you have to repeat many times, low ambiguity environments, performance incentives have a positive impact on outcomes. These are project completion rates. But as you move down the index of ambiguity, you see that very quickly, performance incentives actually are retarding project completion. They're retarding project quality. And that happens very, very quickly with procurement buildings, boreholes and dams, having really significant negative impacts of using performance incentives on those projects. And the question is, does this happen at certain points in the project? Well, so now what you have again is on this y-axis, the marginal effect of CS incentives, so, so performance incentives. And what you have is the different stages of project completion. Closest to me is the initiation of the project. The other side is the completion of the project. And what we see by looking at the marginal effects at every point in the implementation of those projects is that performance incentives are a retarding completion at every stage. So the question is, well, what do we do? What, how do you create environments that bureaucrats can, can perform well in? So we also measured the extent to which the autonomy of individual bureaucrats affected their ability to implement projects. And across the cycle, what you see at the top is the impact of autonomy incentives on different bureaucrats. And what we see is across the, complete, the, the project cycle, we see positive effects of autonomy. Now, one response to this that we received was uh, a paper on China. And they said, well, if you can isolate individual targets, measurable targets, then public sector managers can have people perform on this. And they took the example of SO2 emissions in China. So this is a, a paper by uh, Chen Li and Lu, came out last year. And what they show is that once targets for CO2 emissions were introduced into Chinese bureaucrats' reward functions in 2006, you see a big reduction in SO2 emissions. And so to me, what this conversation between the two papers says is that when you've got public sector managers who have clear targets, the data systems can be put in place and accountability regimes is sufficiently strong, there is evidence that managers will, re will respond. But now let me take you to one particular setting, which is this procurement environment, where in our data, performance incentives have this negative impact. And we're going to go to Pakistan with Oriana Bandiera and co-authors. So what they do is they say, well, let's take a set of procurement officers and experimentally give some of them performance incentives and experimentally give some of them autonomy and another group both and see how they respond. And so these are the results. So what we have here is like a time series graph. So date is on the y, on the x axis. So you're going to see what happens over time to the prices that they pay. And this x axis is now the price paid by these procurement officials. The blue line is the kind of average price in the controls as a benchmark. And the red line is important because that's the moment that they paid performance incentives. Okay, so what happens? To the group that they provided performance incentives, they saw an initial big reduction in prices that procurement officers were able to secure for the items they purchased. But as soon as the performance incentives were paid, those prices escalate well above control. What happens when you give people, experimentally give autonomy to individual bureaucrats? Well, what you do there is you give them the ability to secure lower prices, but they sustainably do so. And so what this line shows us is that autonomy is able to give a kind of continuous lower cost relative to the standard rules of procurement in Russia. And then finally, what if you combine them? Well, actually what happens is that the performance incentives are just reducing, they're just limiting the impact of or autonomy that was given. So both in the cross-section across all public projects or a representative sample of projects in Nigeria and in this experimental case for procurement, we're seeing very similar effects. Now, we've seen this before. There's evidence for distortionary impacts of performance incentives from a wide literature. A famous recent example is Adnan Khan and, and co-authors work again in Pakistan where they incentivize tax collectors with the promise of, of, um, of uh, 
in performance incentives. And they do find a percentage point increase in growth of, of revenue, but almost all individual citizens don't pay more tax. But they do report high levels of bribes and instances of corruption. And the way they see this is you've raised the bargaining game between the individual procurement officers and those citizens. And they're distorting their responses in exactly the way that a good bureaucrat would. Now, this has also been something that's been studied in the U.S. context. And a famous paper is Corti and Mushk. And they find that U.S. agencies, again, they respond to performance incentives in this middle tier, this public administration tier, by skewing reporting which lowers the effectiveness of job training. Actually, Heinrich and Marsh, so Marsh has this nice review of all the evidence from the US. And I want to bring up one particular um, statement from that. And what it says is, the ensuing development and testing of pay performance systems for both personnel management and public accountability is ongoing. Albeit, research suggests that public sector applications have to date met with limited success, primary due to inadequate performance evaluation methods, underfunding of data management systems, and rewards for performance. So while there may be an effective system for pay for performance out there, empirically, for these public administrators, the track reward just isn't as promising as, say, for the front line. Reward structures really need to be able to be evaluated across the broad profile of under tasks undertaken by public sector employees. And that's... That's in many ways what a good public sector manager will do. So Phil Kiefer, who many of you will know or have heard of, once said to me, you see, that's the job of a good job public sector manager, to be able to assess who's doing a good job relative to the broad terms required by public sector tasks. If a computer could do that, it would already be doing so. So the question is, how do we create reward systems that are able to take that broad set of tasks and reward that. Now, there's been greater success in using postings as incentives in recent microeconometric evaluations. So it seemed feasible that postings are based on a much broader assessment of an official's qualities and efforts um, than a performance system could be. And so going back to Pakistan, Adnan and co then use the promise of postings and, and better postings as a reward, and then they see huge effects on tax collection, 44 to 80% increases in, in, in uh, taxation, in the growth rate of tax revenue. Marianne Bertrand and co-authors provide empirical support from India's IAS. What they find is that the perceived motivation is directly related to their probability of reaching the top ranks of public administration. So they, they find that if you come in too late and you haven't got a chance of getting up to the IAS's top echelons, your effort slumps. So moving a little bit to the front lines, there's this lovely paper uh, by Abhijit Banerjee and co-authors that looks at um, police. And it says the promise of transfers to desirable locations motivate police to provide a greater number of more accurate sobriety checks and police checkpoints. And there's this great paper. There's a, a job market candidate at Stanford. He's coming probably next year on the job market. And he uses a matching model to basically estimate what's the impact of ineffective posting in the IAS. And what his estimates argue, he uses a, a matching theory in a natural experiment, is that poor posting costs losing states, the states that get the weakest bureaucrats in India, about 0 0.9, 0 0.5 unit decrease in the HDI score. And India's states are on average, have an HDI score of about 0.6. So these are having huge welfare impacts from an ineffective system of posting in the bureaucracy. Now, a second thing is, so our team have started to survey quite a range of different bureaucrats around the world. And, and something we find really across settings is that when we ask individual bureaucrats to report their satisfaction along multiple margins, their self-reported satisfaction is much more strongly correlated, it's sort of explained, but a lot more of variation is explained by management scores that they're operating under than are various measures of salary. And sort of the, the feedback we get is that working under an effective manager is a reward in itself. It's sort of the most um, critical part of a public sector relationship is being managed effectively and is say in some ways is a reward. 
And so what we find is that not only, and this is, this is scores of individual organizations, so this is their management score using the World Management Survey, which many of you will know. It's a standardized set of questions for measuring management. Is that across organizations, you see a big variation in management. But what's really interesting is that within those organizations, you, you see huge diversity in management. So walking from one unit, one division, walking across the hallway into another, you may see very large changes in management quality. So the question is, is this in itself a mechanism for motivating public officials? And if that's true, how do we forge good management practice? Now, part of the answer in many OECD countries has been to track this management quality in a similar way that we've done in Ghana and then report this back to managers. This helps managers appreciate where they are in the rankings of management quality and management like this allows senior managers to hold their managers to account. Now we've kind of done a little trip around all of the US agencies to get their, their great thoughts on how to manage individuals. And in fact, we went to NASA and they said, actually human resource management is harder than rocket science. <laughs> we've heard is that the federal viewpoint survey, which is two things. One is very detailed down to the unit level, giving this sort of feedback, has been instrumental in identifying what the most effective management techniques are for the US, but also for bringing up individual managers. And actually, we were talking to Kim Wells, who's the, the head of the federal viewpoint survey, and she said, you know, I used to walk into a manager's office and say, here's your results. They're very poor. And I would watch these guys break down in front of me because they thought they were some of the best managers around. They thought maybe a, they needed a strong man to sort of tell them what to do in the office. But really allowing that information updating process may be a useful thing to do in itself, as well as being an accountability structure for senior managers. Now, does any of this apply uh, to the World Bank? Art carefully uh, skirted around the fact that we are probably one of the most dysfunctional bureaucracies <laughs> in the following sense. We have many political principles, we have many tasks. It's amazing that we do so much within these constraints. But actually Dan Honig, uh, he's a colleague of ours at SAIS, so he works just up the road. He did study our TTL. So what he did is he takes um, the projects that we work on and, and, and looks at measures of incentives corresponding to the TTLs who are working on those. And what this does is this graph plots his impact, so his um, project success scores against environmental unpredictability. And what he means on the x-axis here is kind of working in more difficult environments, walking in more like FCV environments or working on more difficult projects. And the, the success on the y-axis is plotted across these difficult axes. And what he shows is that when TTLs are given high autonomy of various different guises, Actually, it doesn't impact the project's success if you move to more uncertain, more difficult environments. But if you constrain that autonomy, then it does. It substantially reduces them. Now, again, this is another piece of cross-sectional work, but what it does is it allows us to show a wide range of literature, some experimental, some otherwise, is very closely fitting the underlying economic theory that we should expect. So the bank is operating as if it were a bureaucracy. And perhaps we should experiment with and test out ways to give our TTLs a little more autonomy. It might do our projects a little good. So this idea of posting brings us to the possibility that public agents gain utility from tasks themselves. Right? People enjoy working on some things and not others. This matters because of the size of the reward that would be optimally given to individuals to undertake a task, but also in terms of the agents that select into service. So it, it implies that it may be important to get officials working on tasks they're motivated by, as this lowers the need to motivate them with extrinsic incentives. Now, I know no study that does this task matching exercise. So showcasing what happens to a bureaucrat when you put them onto a project that they really care about versus something that they don't. So that's certainly a frontier. So what evidence do we have on selection? So the first thing that you could ask is, what evidence do we have across public and private sectors around the world in terms of preferences? We have very little, as you can imagine. But what we do have 
because we now have the worldwide bureaucracy indicators, is some sense of what the wage premium looks like around the world. And so that's the financial incentive you get from moving to the private to the public sector. So what we find in general is across the countries that we work in is that the public sector does have a wage premium across all income levels. So there, there is potentially a pecuniary incentive to work in the public sector. However, this finding is sensitive to the comparison group, the range of variables one can include and so forth. But one thing we find that really does seem to survive quite a bit of torturing is that senior officials in government have a robust negative wage premium. So that means individuals who are senior professional technicians, they're actually moving into government and earning less on average than someone with a similar set of characteristics in terms of um, you know, the observables that we have in the household surveys. And so this is a sort of interesting question. This is very much in line with the idea that more senior officers gain utility from the interesting public good task aspects of their job. Whereas clerks and elementary occupations don't get that satisfaction, and there you do see quite a large pecuniary incentive. Of course, there's questions still to be answered. You know, this is still consistent with the possibility that the senior individuals receive long, large non-wage remuneration, like health insurance and a big office and so forth. But the other thing we wanted to find, and it's nice that the World Bureau of Bureaucracy Indicators kind of hints at this. So we go into admin data, and we look at administrative data on wages in a range of settings. And so what we find is, for individual officers, so now take someone who really is the same years, they, they entered in the same, same year, they've got the same years of experience, they've got the same experience, uh, qualifications. The variation in wages between those two individuals in almost all the settings that we find is extremely large, three or fourfold differences in the wages that individual officers are paid. And so talking about a single wage premium, even for a single category of officer here, is very difficult because of this incredible dispersion. And so what needs to happen is this very micro aspect of following individual officers into the service seeing what happens to them versus their, their compatriots and seeing how they increase these, their, their income so large. And this is work that we're now uh, working on in Brazil. But there are a set of papers that are typically thought of as the real frontier in public administration um, uh, sort of microeconometrics. So the first is Dalbo and Finan and Rossi's paper, 2013, that randomly offered in different locations different wages. To, to become a public official. And what we saw there was that it did attract more able participants. They were not less public service motivated. It increased acceptance rates, and it got people to go to what was sort of thought of as worse municipalities. So there it, was, it had this positive impact, and it didn't have these disadvantages. Similarly, Nava Ashraf and Oriana and Scott, they randomized the offer of career benefits at the recruitment stage for nurses in Zambia. And they find that though this attracts a less pro-social applicant pool in general, of course, you're only going to hire the highest end of that. And for those individuals, they're more talented and equally pro-social. So again, we've got an instance in which higher wages do not seem to be having an impact on pro-sociality, but they increase the quality of the talent pool. And this has real effects on the impacts that they're having in, in uh, in the field, they reduce child mal malnutrition by 25% in the communities that they serve. But of course, ask an economist a question, get multiple answers. So Erica, who's, who's visiting DEC for the next few months, uh, finds, in contrast, that while higher incentives increase the probability of filling a vacancy, they do signal that they convey some sort of cost. And this reduces the ability to recruit the most socially motivated, who are then found to, to have uh, stay longer on the job and perform better. So you've got these individual micro-studies and this global data. So how do we match the two? I would argue that a frontier here is understanding the labour market context in which each of those studies are implemented. And the paper I'd like to highlight now um, does two things. So firstly, let me say this, personality does seem to matter. Right? So Michael Callan has this nice paper where he finds higher scores and personality tests impacts public service motivation, so that's public service motivation, big five, impacts doctors to attend more 
and falsify records less, health inspectors to respond more to accountability inventions, but particularly important for our discussion today, these senior health officials with higher big five scores, these kind of personality scores and public service motivation, they respond more to data on staff absence. They ensure better uh, subsequent attendance. So personality does matter here. But what we want to understand is how a personality is being moved around between the public and private sectors. And I'd like to, to just take a couple of minutes to describe the research of the first Bureaucracy Lab PhD fellow, Ravi Samani. And so what he did over the last couple of years, so he's going to be joining us for a couple of years, so you'll, you'll have a chance to talk to him uh, soon. His job market paper takes the approach that we need to understand the interaction between the public and private sector labour market, really to understand personality selection into the labour market. So what he does is he studies the expansion of tertiary education in Ethiopia. So there's this big push to open universities in Ethiopia, and sort of this happens every so often. But what he does is he then looks at the labour market of districts exposed to a university just before and after it opens compared with their neighbours. So these are the, the university openings that he studies, with the yellow being um, those that are sort of intervened in and the orange, the comparators. But what happens is that when you push a load of tertiary educated human capital into the labour market, that sounds good. But the public sector labour market is a big player in the Ethiopian context, just like in many of the settings, that, as we found out with the WWBI. So what it does is the real wages in the private sector labour markets adjust downwards, right, as they should whilst those in the public sector are rigid. So there are not good wage adjustment mechanisms, at least downwards in the public sector. And so graduates all start queuing for public sector positions and the real wage differential between the two sectors induces the most talented individuals in the private sector labour market to enter graduate training. So because you've got one sector, the public sector, that's dominant for the tertiary educated, not moving, it distorts the allocation of labor. So then basically what happens is you're taking the most talented individuals from the private sector to enter graduate training. You lower the quality of the talent pool in the private sector. And it's this context that we want to know about whether public service motivated agents move into the public sector. But that's exactly what Ravi did. He he looked at civil servants in the public sector through a very comprehensive civil servant survey. He went and surveyed all of these guys. And what he was able to do was look at different thresholds for tertiary expansion at individual district levels. And he finds that university education is raising the level of the following things. And what I do is I just recreate, I just bring the table in so you can kind of see all the things he was able to get data on. He shows that this inflow of tertiary individuals raises the public service motivation. It raises mission alignment. They work harder, more hours a week. And then there's a small impact on their performance evaluation score. You see, it may simply be that university is raising the intrinsic motivations of everyone. And the distorted labor markets are funneling more of them into the public sector. But it's only through this kind of econometric detective work that Ravi's paper is a good example of that we can really find out. So what we have to do to understand the sort of selection issues that, that these individual studies on is I think collect data at the labor market level, both public and private sectors in this way to really get a, a handle on the topic. And it's a wide open uh, research area. So that gives you a sense of, of how the literature has dealt with the economics of public administration. So now what about the political? Now, what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to try and take each of the topics we've discussed so far and introduce political constraints into them, see what that political angle tells us. So Saad Gulzar and Ben Pasquale, what they did was they looked at multitasking and they looked at Indian districts. So this is now a study from India in which constituency boundaries overlap block executive boundaries. And so what happens is individual bureaucrats, they have two political masters. So what does that do? So they, they focus on INREGA, uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. And what they find is, again, as economic theory would predict, once you put two politicians on a single bureaucrat, 
it reduces the quality of NREGA. Um, as they state, our findings suggest that politicians face strong incentives to motivate bureaucrats as long as they internalize the benefits from doing so. So as long as you're working on what I want you to work on, I'm going to motivate you. And politicians are able to do so. They sort of understand the wider task environment of the bureaucracy. So this idea that when you bring politics as a potential feature of the incentive environment, well, political principles implies that you're going to be working on, on political uh, ends. And so what I do in, in a paper in Nigeria is that I find that politicians empowered by being given a sectoral committee, they become a powerful player in, say, the health and, um, sector. And so for health bureaucrats, they suddenly gain quite an additional layer of power by, by moving on to the, the sectoral committee. So what do they do? They certainly motivate bureaucrats. They're able to move bureaucrats to work. So they increase the likelihood of a, a project starting and they increase the proportion of it actually created. But this comes at the cost of quality. So how do they do this? So again, using civil servant surveys, we can actually ask individual, either the budget office or whatever. So what they do is they increase the budget release in the first half of the year. They basically get money out to individual bureaucrats to start the projects in their constituencies, as you'd expect a politician wants. But then they pressure bureaucrats to shift contractors. They pressure bureaucrats to change the specifications of the project and to divert funds. And this works. Um, they're rational agents. And so the politicians do improve the chances of their re-election by using these patronage projects in their constituencies. And I do want to just highlight a methodological point. You know, one of the benefits of doing these in-depth civil servant surveys is that you can follow the channels through which politicians are operating. Because you can ask bureaucrats about, you know, did you see others breaking rules along these margins? Did you get pressure uh, to, to, to be corrupt along multiple margins? And so forth. And now touching on some work that Stuti's done, where we mentioned the imp importance of bureaucratic personality measures. Stuti's done exactly the same, but for also for politicians. And so what she did here with co-authors is survey Ugandan politicians and bureaucrats on a range of personality characteristics. So this is a, a graph that kind of describes the bureaucrats versus the politicians characteristics along the margins that you see on the x axis on the y axis and so what we see is that bureaucrats differ from politicians they're different people different types of people bureaucrats have more integrity grit decision making capacity and aversion to hostility the kind of thing that we're all characterized by <laughs> and politicians score higher on personality traits and altruism but interestingly, she then goes on to look at, she takes political integrity as a measure, some, some micro-founded measure. And what she finds is that political integrity of politicians in a district is significantly predictive of service delivery outcomes there. So the right kind of politicians are pushing bureaucrats to perform along particular margins. So this interaction is real. Uh, you know, in some ways, the idea that bureaucratic and individual politician personalities should matter is very new. There's very little theory here to really guide us on how to embed this kind of work into the public sector administration literature more generally. All right. The next thing we talked about was selection. And selection and patronage and selection in bureaucracy is a very widely debated issue. People say often that's the route people have into the public sector. And so I wanted to highlight two recent papers on this from Brazil. So Broyo et al. and Colonelli et al., both from 2018, assess the extent to which supporters of successful candidates in close elections in Brazil yield different public sector outcomes. And so what these graphs show is the following. If you support a candidate, either you are a candidate in the same party or you give them money, then the moment that they get into office, and that's this year since election zero, suddenly the likelihood that you're going to become a civil servant increases significantly. And so what's happening here is that politicians are bringing in their colleagues or their donors as a kind of patronage form, as a patronage payment for their time in, um, in supporting their, their political campaign. 
But what's interesting about this is that they were only able to show this was true for a minority of positions. And it reminds me of this fantastic early paper in this literature by Ayer and Manny. And what they showed was the following. So they now look again at IAS offices in India. And they state that bureaucrats early on in their careers have two routes to future success. So either you develop a reputation for expertise or you build loyalty to politicians. So this is kind of like multiple routes to success. Now, the actual existence of multiple routes has wider costs. Given that competence is not the only consideration, they show that junior officers underinvest in, in, in gaining competence. However, they highlight that there is this individual choice problem that effective bureaucracies have solved between success through performance-based routes and success through patronage-based routes. And the big question here is how do we create choices for bureaucrats that are responsive to politicians, but not spilling over into patronage? And so how has the world answered this big question? So China, which is the big elephant in the room whenever you study public administration, China has found a balance between political responsiveness and bureaucratic patronage by merging the two systems, by making bureaucratic success the focal route to political power. So there's this book um, by Yuan Yong Ang, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, where she describes how these shortlist report cards, like this, this is Shanghai's 1989 report card, and this is like a scoring matrix, like an OPE for a mayor. And what she shows is that these kind of cascade down through government, linked but really individual scores for each mayor and each senior bureaucrat. And though the individual scores are kept secret, rankings vis-a-vis -vis peers are all announced annually. So putting social pressure on peers to rank well. And as she states, the target system substitutes for elections. So the idea here is that if you're a, if you're a bureaucrat, political pressure is totally part of your incentive environment because you are the politician. Of course, not everyone wants to merge their political and uh, bureaucratic systems. And so I think China also has lessons for countries that don't have single party bureaucracy systems. So this is another paper that just came out last year. And this is by Suarez Serato, Wang and Zhang. And what they show is that self-reported performance in enforcing the one child policy, which is said to be important for your promotion prospects in China, that self-reported performance does impact promotion. They actually find that on self-reports, China was trying to raise the best and brightest, or they find evidence consistent with China trying to raise the best and brightest to the highest levels of, of the party. However, Every so often there's a census from which a non-manipulated performance measure is drawn. And this does not predict promotions. So around census years, the most effective mayors in terms of the one child policy are promoted. Outside of census years, when less data is available, it's those that know how to play the system that rise. Now, partly, as well as sort of enabling a, a wider range of incentive performance options, creating that rigorous data basically mediated the role that politics could play in the rise up the bureaucracy. You know, partly this is by creating an incentive to report truthfully, but partly it's because it creates political pressure to promote the highest performance. And in some ways, this is exactly what the history of the US is personnel administration has been, a vibrant oversight and strong vertical accountability. So as I said, today, the Federal Viewpoint Survey is published. It's taken to Congress. People talk and debate these sort of issues at the highest levels. And that vibrancy has meant that data has shined a light on any kind of political ramifications, unless they occur at the most senior levels. So what I want to argue here is that independent data on public administration reduces the role for distortionary politics. Now, let me make a shout out. These topics and issues are highlighted 
and explained beautifully in the two books that have recently come out from the banks. We've got the governance and the law from the GGP and Stuti's Making Politics Work for Development. And they flesh out many of these issues and give us a contextual environment to understand some of the issues that I've brought up. Now, one place that we've been pushed quite hard by Debbie, Asmin, and others in the GGP is to really think about fixing bureaucracies in, in fragile and conflict states. So I want to put a slide on here. You know, Ponce conflict state building is an increasingly, uh, increasing area of the, uh, the bank's public administration work. However, the, the fundamental difference here is that the state does not have a solid monopoly on violence. So what does that do to the political trade-offs that one has to make? There's a trade-off when you face this kind of balance. So in the environments I've been talking about, there is a performance versus patronage trade-off. Here it's at its most extreme. Basically, to keep the country stable in the short term, you have to use patronage. You have to basically allow elites to hand out public jobs and resources to constituents regardless of merit. So here, the need for a dual system, like we've seen in other cases, basically balancing performance and patronage, is the most acute. And so work that Jürgen Blum, one of our colleagues in the GGP, and, and I have done, really argues that the transition away from, from this is, A, to recognize this political trade-off is very real, and it ensures the stability of the, of the uh, political state, but it also allows us to understand how we might construct these two trade-offs and make the performance track the one that civil servants want to undertake. Okay. So finally, we're going to turn to the social and cultural determinants of the production function for bureaucracies. And I'm afraid here we have almost no microevidence. Um, we have many in indications. So this section is going to be much more of an agenda going forward than a description of existing results. It takes us a little bit beyond the frontier of the microempirical research agenda. So a third defense against over-politicization of the bureaucracy is to build a strong service identity. Interesting, Tim Besley, James Perry, that's of the Perry Motivation Index, and Erin McDonnell, representing their professions of economics, public administration, and sociology, have all presented at the Bureaucracy Lab in the last year. And each of them concluded with a similar sentiment. Basically, this is Erin's slide that summarizes it nicely. Their argument is that we have to pre create protected clusters of teams with focal identities, these professional norms, and a shared um, identity. What this does is it shares basically, um, it makes the more autonomous, intrinsically motivated, and robust against political interference teams that are, are sort of more able to operate than the standard bureaucracy. And this could be at the unit level, organization, cadre level. These are platforms for individuals to boost their individual professional value and gain competence and information in a specific area. You know, what evidence do we have from what I've just told you that this, is, that this might matter? Looking back over the presentation so far, both the postings results and China promotion system could be seen in some way as building professional norms. Intrinsically motivated agents will select into the public sector when there's a clear professional norm for service delivery. And this actually seems to be happening in the real world. So not formally evaluated, there are examples like Rwanda has put in a system that basically fuses the modern concept of performance contracts with the traditional public commitments called IMHIGO or Vow to Deliver, and it seems to be having big impacts. Similarly, the Institute of State Effectiveness in Georgetown that we work with regularly, they've tried some of this work in Timor-Leste and Afghanistan, and again, have emphasized the importance of social components of a public official's rewards. So if I was to sort of think forward I think a, a sort of service, a shared service identity is a real agenda for people here to take up. But the first thing we have to do is understand what we mean by identity. Is it shared experience, joint beliefs, commitment to a common cause? And myself and a few others, these are the three micro evaluations that I know of. Erica and I, uh, with Vincent and, and uh, Pons and Jen, are basically testing this impact of shared experience in appraisal reform in Liberia. I'm doing some work with Imran Rasul and, and Martin Williams, testing the ability of different training methods to change service culture. And Leonard Wonchakon, who I'm sure you most, most of you know, are testing this idea of small group therapy in, uh, in Benin. Actually, Sanjay Pahuja, I don't know if he's here, he basically has started trying to bring this work into operations and seems to be having success. So this is very much 
the frontier of how we can understand the public sector administration. All right, so how is it going to end? So I'll try and put a synopsis together very briefly. The task space for public administrations is distinctive to frontline officials. There's a greater room for ambiguity, for complexity. And incentives seem to be effective when they work on professional values, getting to work on preferred topics, the means of boosting an individual's professional standing. In some sense, we know politics will ex always exist. Um, therefore, we're defining a kind of choice environment for public officials who can either take routes where performance matters or they can use patronage to succeed. But we need to complement that with a culture of communication that communicates professional norms. Now, I've argued really data, and I'm slightly pitching for the lab's work here, is that data could be a part of supporting those processes. So if that's too long a synopsis, just always think, every time you look into your government counterpart's eyes and think, I'm really talking to James Bond here. <laughs> I want to give someone the sense that they are autonomous, that they have a mission, that they have the opportunity to search out information on a case-by-case -case basis. And a culture of strong professional relationships is something that they're embedded in. So what does all this finally mean for policy and research at the World Bank? The Bureaucracy Lab tries to be something that echoes the research findings that I've talked about so far. It tries to be an entity that can work with government to support the collection of this kind of data, exposing and highlighting problems specific to units and organizations. It wants to be independent in that data collection so that these impartial benchmarks can act as a means of incentivizing accountability. And if we are able to warehouse large volumes of data from the public administration, we will be a resource for researchers, bank staff, analysts, and so on. A coordinator also of methodological research in the same way that the LSMS and the enterprise surveys have better understood how to survey those entities. So one more video. And a sense that we are excited about what role we can play as we go forward into the future. You know, we've already been successful in many ways. With Daniel Ortega in Brazil, the lab worked with state and federal payroll to present granular wage bill models and projections. And this gave the country, at the moment it needed it, analytical foundations for their wage and pension decisions. In Ethiopia, with Elsa Arena and uh, Elsa Araya and Verena Fritz, we collaborated with the Commission for Civil Service to generate the most detailed diagnostic of the public administration they'd ever had. Just at the moment that the state of the emergency occurred, and they said, we need a 15-year roadmap to change our public service. And so this became the foundation of that. And in Ghana, we collaborated with the office of the head of the civil service to collect three years' worth of productivity data relating to that task data I showed you at the beginning. So now we have data on every organization in the public service, which is here. So these dots are the individual organizations and the, num the proportion of the, the tasks that I showed you that they actually completed. There's a lot of uncompleted tasks there. But what happened was the head of the civil service, he used this to create performance contracts with each of his chief directors. And so we didn't just do this at the organization level, we went to the unit level. And so we were able to help individual managers basically track the performance of their civil service and help lagging units, but also keep senior officials, create accountability for lagging organizations. So we were able to mimic some of the work we saw in that academic work in China and elsewhere and provide those services to countries. You know, the, the feeling here is that we are co-producing, co-producing between DEC and the GGP, uh, co-producing between the lab and government, and then also putting that data online so that other people can use it. You know, DIME's approach is very much to iterate with partners, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the lab. To change government, really, I feel, one has to change its own understanding of itself. And that's best done from within, co-producing data that the government helped design and own. And each step of this helps transform our ability to diagnose, de design, and evaluate more effective reforms. To close. <clears throat> 
I want to reflect on what Asmin has always said to me about working in the bank, that the most important thing in this place is the relationships you build. I'm working on the bureaucracy lab very closely with my GGP colleagues has shown me that operations staff are actually very good friends. <laughs> They're good people. And so I want to say thank you to them and may the revolution continue. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, now, uh, Debbie, five to ten minutes yep. for discussion. Thanks very much. I'll be very brief because we want to get to your questions. But let me, uh, let me start literally where uh, Dan ended. Uh, data is really important, and I just want to uh, give a, a very quiet tribute to Steve Knack, who was an old uh, and uh, steadfast partner in the work here in DEC and in governance and in the bank. And so uh, nobody knew more than he did how important data was to progressing our efforts. So uh, our thoughts are with him today. Um, I will confirm, as Dan has suggested, that the World Bank is a bureaucracy um, and that your boss does matter. So <laughs> you intimated some of that. Um, and I guess what I'll do is try to nest uh, much of the great information that uh, Dan has provided in a broader context of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, and as an institution on some of these issues related to public admin and civil service reform. But let me first start out by, by saying um, I'm here because I'm such a big fan of the Bureaucracy Lab. I think the work that the teams have been doing in digging down and uncovering detailed information about how public services uh, in their different forms and units work couldn't be more important. Um, uh, and it promises a lot for the future. Uh, recently, I've had a number of conversations with high-level folks in the bank, whether it's VPs or directors of strategy and operations, and they turn to me and they say, do we still do civil service reform? Um, you know, we used to do it. We used to do it back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it leaves me a little bit frustrated because I'm, I suggest to them, yes, we're doing lots of reforms in lots of different ways. So I can only encourage you to, to get out and interact with folks. And, and when I respond, I say, well, there's a number of things that are on the table in terms of what we're doing now. So what we see coming at us, uh, given the rising fiscal pressures in the world, um, is this continued request for how do we reduce wages? How do we build capacity? Um, and how do we make governments work better? So all issues that in some way or another you talked about and that I think we could take the work of the, the lab and, and track that a little bit more closely. So whether it's, um, gee, let's not go for a straight wage cut because that may be, we, we might have information to tell us what's working well and what's not working well. And many of uh, you are probably working in countries where you run the numbers of the size of civil servants and if you have to let people go, what that means for the budget and pensions, et cetera. But that pressure is increasing. And so the more we can get micro data and micro thinking into what's needed, uh, the more that will be helpful. Uh, every time I go to the board, you know, why can't we build institutional capacity is the question I get um, after domestic resource mobilization and illicit financial flows. But capacity building is an issue. Those of you who work in the Africa region will know that the previous VP, Mokhtar, was very, very focused on trying to build these uh, uh, cohorts, you may call them, uh, the, the ANAs or the, the schools of public administration to create a, a, an ethic, a body, a set of norms and standards. And so that's a question to be explored of, you know, we, we have a number of different ways in which we've tried to promote institutional capacity building, but thinking a little bit about what your data tells us when you put together the who gets paid, what, what the, the, the incentives are, what the performance, if you have data on outcomes of what people are doing with these tasks, that the whole circles on who does what and multitasking, I, I suppose we all live it every day because we're all multitasking, but how we use that information usefully could be really important. Um, and how to make uh, civil servants, bureaucrats work better. So 
I myself did a lot of work on performance management in Brazil. Um, there was always this issue of trying to attribute uh, a performance to an individual or to a team. And uh, we did a lot of really interesting and successful work. And then it got lost in a tidal wave of a big political turnover when, uh, when Dilma lost uh, when the transition occurred in 2014, she didn't lose, but uh, it was quite a quite a big shift in the political agenda. So there's lots of things that we're working on right now that it would be really, uh, you've already started to unpack how some of these things apply by the work that you're doing on the ground in West Africa and in Ethiopia and India and elsewhere. Thinking about how we can reach out to the staff and help them understand that um, will be important. Um, Another topic that is not where we are right now, but is coming down the tracks as fast as can be, is this question of jobs and economic transformation. So several years back, we did a WDR on jobs. We had a, a, a CCSA, so a, a joint group working on how do we advance the jobs agenda. But Countries around the world, uh, and we see this in the IDA discussions that are occurring right now, they're just freaking out because the demographics is such that the youth bulge is growing, particularly in Africa. And we are struggling to come up with a, a jobs agenda that uh, is effective. And we've talked about this before, but one of the issues that I think couldn't be more important that's in the data that you have and every, have, every time I have a chance to talk about it is this question of what is the relationship between public and private sector. So when we get into the JET agenda, we almost always go direct to, directly to private sector. And in many of the countries that we work in, you're not going to be able to address private sector employment issues, whether it's wages, premiums, um, mobility, uh, all that type of thing, until you understand uh, what's going on in the public sector. Because more often than not, the security in the public sector or some of the things you talked about right now, the reason why people choose to go into the public sector uh, rather than private, impedes the growth that's there. And so I think there's a huge value in the work that the lab does to be able to bring that out more and to just say, look, we have information. We, we, you made the point about looking at labor markets overall. As an institution, we haven't done that very well. Um, and we struggled over the years to where do we put labor? Is it, if, you know, what different place should it be in? But now that is becoming an urgent issue. Uh, it's always been urgent, but we need to think about that. And the details and the work that you're doing with the micro data could be very helpful. And then finally, um, I guess the future is something I'd also like to put on the table. You spoke a little bit of fra about fragility, which is one of the topics I wanted to mention, but I won't go into that because I want to leave time for others to discuss. But I do think um, there is a very, very serious, important thing we need to think about as we look at civil service and public administration and how it works, which is this whole question of how technology uh, and digital transformation is going to affect the civil service and what it does. So we li we've lived for these many years in a vertical model where, uh, you know, the governments sort of sit at the center and people come to them and work that gets done is very much uh, 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 concentrated and centered uh, in a, a model of uh, a, a vertical relationship. Technology is really changing that and changing how citizens interact with government changing how services can be delivered for those who have followed this whole digital moonshot or the transformation, the GovTech stuff that's being done. Um, I don't think civil servants, uh, they, they, they've worked on technology to the extent of please give me a system so I can pay taxes or so I can manage spending if miss or other such things. But this whole question of how this transformation is going to affect uh, how government works, what it does, um, I don't think we've even begun to think through what those transformations imply for the bureaucrats that are sitting and may or may not have tech, tech capacities, may or may not be needed depending on what they do and how they do it. So that's, that's a, an area for looking forward that we need to help our, our uh, 
counterpart countries think through when they're working through what to do and how to prepare for the future. So I'll stop there so we have some time for questions. Thanks very much. And thanks for the fantastic work. Keep going. Thank you, Debbie. Rather than um, uh, give Dan an opportunity to respond, I think maybe we'll go around and take uh, take some questions that you can then gather together uh, with points from Debbie that you'd like to uh, address. Um, uh, David, go ahead. So given you mentioned this multitasking issue, I, I wonder if you're concerned that by measuring only part of what these public servants do, you actually distort them away from doing what they should be doing to the extent that your tools start getting used for benchmarking. Owen, go ahead. I was intrigued by some of the summaries that you gave early on of the, the structure of bureaucracies, whether in Ghana or elsewhere. And I wondered uh, if you had any comment on the differences between that structure, that the 40 percent of the body is responsible for keeping the beast alive. Uh, how different is that structure that you observe in, in Ghana or another bureaucracy from that of, let's say, the World Bank, with which many of us are quite familiar, or of private sector entities? So whether on that graph or any other, I wondered if you had any comment on that, on the relationships and the patterns that you see. Just while you're thinking of further questions, let me uh, um, add one question and one comment. Um, uh, the, the, I, I had a question about multitasking as well, but it was a different angle, which is that I think you're focused mostly on the fact that an uh, individual bureaucrat or a small group of bureaucrats performs many tasks. But it's also true that the sort of output that you require from the government requires inputs from many different bureaucrats. So that's the other sort of a horizontal dimension of multitasking. And I was wondering whether there's insights from this research on how sort of solving that coordination problem, you know, I can't give you that permit because the idiots in Ministry X never signed on the dotted line, that sort of dynamic works differently in, in the public sector versus in, in the private. And then, and then the other comment or observation is that um, in a lot of the analysis, you look at, uh, you know, people are either bureaucrats or they're private sector workers. But it seems like there's a lot to be learned from looking at sort of the career path in and out, particularly at higher levels. And I was struck by that when you were showing the, the wage, um, uh, the negative wage premium for senior bureaucrats, you know, in, you know, the IRS, for example, is full of, you know, high priced tax lawyers who are taking an 80% pay cut to write the rules that they will then subsequently advise clients on once, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, it's perfectly legal and reasonable career path, but that, that, you know, sheds light on these sort of Anyway, so, uh, we'll give Dan a chance to respond and then go around with another round. No, I mean, fantastic uh, questions, and uh, thank you, Debbie, for the discussion's comments. I mean, in terms of the operational kind of services that we should provide, everything you're saying is good. It's, you know, putting more on the plate, which yeah. is uh, welcome, yeah, yeah. but uh, in some ways we've, you know, we've tried to start moving particularly towards FCV and technology, you know, Zahid's experience in, in doing the WDR and technology, is trying to understand these things from more, you know, what is it that we want technology to do? So, you know, if we're trying to change the accountability structures in the public service, exactly what are the incentives to do that? So we've really tracked this from the kind of incentives that I'm talking about here. How is technology disrupting those? Okay. Um, but I think broadly, I think everything you're, you're asking for for operations is very fair. You know, I think, and I'm going to go, Bo, go backwards. So we, we asked um, in a couple of cases, so let me take Ghana as an example, public officials to basically assess the extent to which they have um, or they perceive particular aspects of the production function as, you know, stopping them from achieving their own tasks. And in almost every sort of uh, organization we went to, the extent to which other organizations or other units were not keeping up their end of the bargain was the sort of number one impact on their ability to produce. So a little bit like an O-ring theory of, of product production where I can't produce simply because I don't have the inputs from others. And so to, we, we've done two things to do this. One is that we've started measuring this. So we basically make requests, standardized requests across organizations, and we see the extent to which those requests come back in, in some sense to a high enough quality that they can be used and the speed. And so by deadlines we give 
typically about half of responses come back, all are good enough quality, but then we basically never hear from the other half of government. So you've got a 50-50 chance of getting the input you need. I think in any technical environment outside of the service, that's just, you know, would not be something that could survive. But of course, because we don't have the competitive pressures to force units out, we're not going to see that. So I think it's very important sort of thinking about the interventions to get organizations to better cooperate. That's a pretty tricky one. So in some of the work we're doing in Ghana with, uh, with Imran and Martin, we are trying to train people to better serve independent units. But there's so many problems within the unit itself that that's always a secondary concern. Yeah. So I think interventions, if you, if you or anyone else has ideas on how to get organizations to better gel, I think would be very welcome. Then this idea of our own measurements distorting the possibility of we feed back. So the first thing is that um, I suppose that measurement system that I talked about at the end started life purely as an academic exercise, right? So all we wanted to do was trait to take as much of a, a, a census of all tasks being undertaken. And that actually had pre-existing uh, documentation. So that was commitments by every organization and unit to the presidency. So in some sense, there's two questions. One is, is that a complete census? But I think you were asking is, once we start to use that for performance agreements, what does that do to measurement? Is that kind of along the lines? I think that's a good question for all of our work. You know, once people start to think of us as a doing business, then are they going to lie on the surveys? Um, so we've tried a number of different ways of getting at that. So trying to get objective measures, and then asking a range of different ways of asking questions about different topics, including tasks. And then try to benchmark the extent to which we can create questions, measurement tools that are sort of robust to those things. Um, one example is in doing business, they always go and get independent audited kind of evidence of things happening. And so we've tried a little bit to get at that, but it's always going to be a bit of a weakness because we are also asking individuals, tell us about the management that you experience. So. I think it's a fair question, something we've tried sort of methodologically to experiment away from. Yeah. Um, and then the idea of how different, you know, sort of how different are the structures of the bureaucracies that we're working with, either to those in other developing countries or to the private sector here. I mean, let's take that 40%. So uh, that entered that sort of 40% we only have data from one other place, and it's similarly very high. Um, you know, it's relatively rare to get a cataloging of every single task that everyone in an organization does. Um, in some sense, what's interesting is across agencies within the same government. And there, unlike many things, we don't see a lot of variation, that all agencies seem to be doing a lot of this stuff for themselves. And so there's a, a sort of, you know, there's some variation that we can get at trying to say, well, why don't we move the best organization in Ghana um, and move everyone towards it? But on this particular margin, there really isn't a best organization. This seems to be a very common theme across the agencies that we're looking at. Yeah. More comments or questions? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's a tremendous. I mean, the work you guys are doing is, is great and a, a fantastic presentation. Um, sort of a comment and then a, a question. Um, the, probably the most striking slide, I would think, to anybody, senior manager or, politi or politician, will be the breakdown of what bureaucrats are actually doing. Yeah? So I think many of you have taken aback, and certainly citizens would be very taken aback that their bureaucrats are spending 40% you know, of the time on what's like very internal tasks, et cetera. And I guess the question is um, sort of twofold. One is the extent to which, you know, as part of kind of building capability, is there a question of trying to rebalance the work that the bureaucrats actually are doing, and are there ways of sort of tackling that? And the second comes to motivations, because really what you're talking about across the board is sort of the different types of motivations and whether you're sort of aligning with the politics, if you're creating a kind of corporate culture around that. And uh, it just seems to me that perhaps the nature of the motivation depends on the nature of the subtask that the one bureaucrat or one unit um, needs to be undertaking, because forgive this, this is going to be a horrible pun, but I'm worried that the bureaucracy might end up shaken but not stirred. <laughs> Yes, please step up to one of the microphones. Thanks. 
Yeah. So what about the legal institutions in place in some of these places? Because it seems like if there's no enforcement, like there's, no, I mean, there's no penalty to taking a bribe or, you know, committing some type of fraud by a bureaucrat. They have really no incentive to change their behavior just because I think some of these countries lack legal institutions that are good enough. Okay, so, yeah, so on the legal institutions, I mean, what's interesting about measurement of de facto practices is you often find that to de jure, the laws that everyone in public service is supposed to implement are exactly the same, sort of across organizations, including accountability, including the extent to which people feel that they are going to be punished for undertaking particular actions. Whereas here, um, what we see is that that, even if you've got the same legal traditions within a single uh, organization with a single service is that the likelihood of those actions actually being de facto applied by a manager or by, a, by an organizational head vary tremendously across uh, within the, the, the entity. And so I'm, I'd be very interested to hear more about where you think, you know, kind of we don't have effective legal institutions in you know public services typically the public service has a very you know long legal mandate and there's lots of rules and you're told what you should and shouldn't do what the punishments are for it the problem is really actually enforcing those those rules and that seems to be very in at the manager level we're literally talking you know sort of institution manager level that seems to vary tremendously within the same service so i think the legal institutions maybe interact with enforcement, but I think that that's how I see it. The de facto enforcement is just not happening. Yeah. You know, in some ways, your, your question goes a little bit, um, you know, to this idea of, you know, how different are different structures of bureaucracies. Is it right that bureaucracies should be spending 40% of their time? It's very, to me, unclear what an optimal balance is. Um, it did make me wonder how much time I spend you know, worrying about myself and my own stuff. And, but in some sense, because we don't have that comparable data, it's very difficult to say that the most efficient institutions, Denmark, Singapore, are, are spending a lot less of their total bureaucracy time on these actions. So the way I'd respond is we need to go and collect that data. And in fact, we do just have a project starting in the EC. We hope to go to Denmark. You know, we hope to go to other settings in which we're able to say, you know, what is the specific structure of your bureaucracy? Something that we at least perceive of as closer to the production frontier and then compare aspects of that, including sort of task distribution. So I think it's in some ways an, a question to be answered just because the data is not available yet. Um, do you have any of the data broken down by gender? And then also even just diversity data. Are, have you been able, I know in Peru that there's a belief that um, female traffic cops are less likely to take bribes. Is there any data to support that? And have you seen diversity within bureaucracies create better bureaucracies? Um, so this is, I think, super interesting. And I can, only, I can tell you some descriptive statistics. We are actually thinking about fielding experiment all about trying to inject more females into different public service environments. So in a number of different cases, when you look at management as reported by individuals, so f females typically say that they are managed worse and managers who have a higher fraction of their staff as women typically report themselves that they manage worse, right? So there's something interesting there. Secondly is that, um, there are aspects of officialdom which seem to have absolutely not be impacted at all by um, that you that you'd think sort of like career progression, likelihood of um, um, you know kind of getting a good rating on subjective performance. That stuff seems to have no like no difference in the first ten grades or something, the first up until the meeting, and then it massively kicks in for senior bureaucrats. So there just seems to be this very thick glass ceiling above which in the bureaucracy it's very hard for females to go. Now that's probably likely to be partly cultural. And so I think again, you know, I think what we need to do is better understand where, like in the Philippines, they have very high proportions of females, even amongst senior ranks. And then, you know, what is the culture and environment that's allowing that to happen? Um, so yes, there's some very interesting statistics. Um, 
I still think it's better to be a female in the public sector than it is in the private. Um, compression ratios, so the, the, like, the dollar loss that you get from your wages of being a female in the public or private, in the WWBI, almost typically you're closer to the male wage in the, in the public sector. So. All right, well, uh, thank you very much to everybody for coming. Thank you to Debbie for discussing and for Dan uh, for, a, for a great presentation. You should now go and enjoy a richly deserved vodka martini with your lunch. And uh, yeah, he said it already, so we won't do that. Um, and uh, uh, looking forward to the next policy research talk. Thanks. Thank you.